and give a hand to the Lord. Come on. You guys pray with me. Father, what a good reminder that you're bigger than all that's going on in this world because you are sovereign over all. God, there is not a moment uh, of hardship that's wasted, but you have purposes beyond what we can even comprehend. And God, we cling to the promise that you work all things together for the good of those who love you and who are called according to your purpose. So, Father, we always gather with hope. Uh, no matter what's going on in the world, God, we, your people, always have cause to celebrate. We always have hope to cling to that will never fail us. We thank you for that truth. We pray, God, you would remind us this morning of our ultimate call and what it is that you have told us to be about as we are passing through this world. We love you, Lord, and pray all these things in Jesus' good name. Amen. You can have a seat. Well, good morning, church family. My name is Matt, one of the pastors here. It's good to gather on the first cold, snowy morning. Is this our first snow? I mean, that last thing we had wasn't a real snow, right? That was like a dust dusting. It's like the first maybe real snow. But we're in a teaching series called The Heart of Redemption Church, and we've been looking through our vision, mission, ministry, philosophy, and our values. And it's really important for us, I think, to be reminded on a regular basis of what we value most and why we do the things that we do as a church. I think if you grew up in the church, uh, you weren't really trained to ask the question, why? Like, why do we do this? Why do we do church the way we do church? What's the purpose of all this? Like, you just kind of did it because that's what was normal, right? You just kind of got swept up into a tradition and, and you just, you don't really ask why. But we as a church want to be always asking the question, why? Why do we do what we do? Why do we value what we value? And, and do we have biblical precedent for everything that we do? And if you start reading the Bible from page one, you see that scripture from the very first pages casts a vision for us as humanity to be a people who would be fruitful, who would multiply, who would fill the earth and flourish, living simple lives under God's rule and God's blessing. But a couple chapters later, Genesis chapter 3, we see the fall of man where our first parents take the bait. They disobeyed the one command, the one instruction that they were given, and thus sin enters the world. Our relationship with God has been estranged. We're now plagued with relational conflict. Anyone have conflict with their spouse this last week? Anyone ever have conflict with their parents? Anyone have a hard time parenting their not so obedient children. Okay, conflict abounds, and it abounds through relationships. As we look around in all the relationships in our lives, they are not what we'd hoped that they would be, and this is the devastating consequence of sin. And while sin is the legacy that you and I are born into, we inherit from birth, it is not the legacy that we have to leave behind. It's not what we have to live in bondage for because of Jesus Christ. And the two values we're going to look at today as, as a church are our values of generational legacy and intentional simplicity. So let's just go ahead and dive right into generational legacy. We have a, a summary on our website that reads like this. I'll put it on the overhead too. It says, we will joyfully embrace God's mandate to invest spiritually into the next generation we will focus our energy on discipling followers of Jesus to embrace biblical priorities, biblical parenting, biblical manhood and womanhood, and biblical marriage, marriages that reflect God's good design. Do we talk a lot about the Bible? Yes. Our desire is to equip each individual and family to see the gospel have generational impact, faithfully passing on the good deposit that has been entrusted to us. If you've read through much of the Bible, specifically the Old Testament, you see the concept of generational legacy all over the place. It's something that is just repeated over and over and again through different forms and fashions, through commands, through stories, whatever it may be. But from the very beginning of Israel's existence, God set forth a vision for generational legacy. 
He set forth a vision, but here's what's important for us to know is that he answers that why question right up front. He answers the why question. He just doesn't tell us what to do. He tells us why to do it. So let's look at Genesis chapter 12, the call of Abram, who will become Abraham. He says this, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and to him who dishonors you I will curse. And then here's the global vision right here. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Why did God call Abram to become the father of Israel so that all the families of the earth would be blessed. That's the vision. That's God's heart that we would flourish as families here on earth. And as God's people began to grow, he gave them more and more instruction on what it would look like to be families that flourish under God's rule and blessing. In 1400 B.C., God gave Moses these words after delivering the the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. Deuteronomy 6. These should be familiar words to many of us. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a a sign on your hand, and they shall be as a frontlet between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So here we see God instructing his people, and he starts with the heart. Love God. Love your maker with everything you are, with your entire being. Keep his commands, his rules. They're good for you. They're the guides through which you will flourish. And then pass them on. Pass them on diligently to your children. Continue to pass on the faith. And yet, at this point, we need to pause and recognize that on our own, as evidenced through Israel's history, we can never do this. You and I, in our own volition and in our own strength, cannot obey this command from the mouth of God. We simply can't do it. And again, Israel's history of of, uh, just this cycle of falling away from God and coming back to God, falling away from God, coming back to God. I think a lot of us have seen those cycles even within our own families, have we not? Maybe in your own life you've kind of experienced that. It's like, man, I love God so much in this season that I don't know what happened. And then he brought me back. It just there's this, there's this nature, this cyclical nature of being hot and cold. Then at the peak of Israel's history, as they're established as a nation and they're a kingdom, in 980 B.C., we see the psalmist Asaph repeat the same biblical theme of generational legacy. Psalm 78, he says, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn. And arise and tell them to their children. Why? So that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And here's where we see they failed historically to do this. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. All right, so once again, the scripture tells us, pass on the glorious deeds of the Lord. Tell the next generation, even the next generation not born yet, of all the things that God has done so that we might continuously place our hope in God, not in the things of this world. 
But time and time again, Israel failed. The fathers of Israel failed in their spiritual leadership, and they failed to leave a generational legacy of blessing. Now, if you were to stop and look at your own family tree, how many of you would say, man, like my family tree is filled with a strong legacy of faith? Would we have anyone in the room who would say that? Like, raise your hand for real. Like, it's very few, okay? <laughs> it's very, very few when we look at our own family and see a strong legacy of faith. And I think that there's reason for this, but again, it's something that just goes to say that we have a sin nature and left on our own, we are selfish, sinful people that will always live for number one, which isn't God, it's me. And yet, here we're called to live for the hope of the future generation and that the hope and source is only found in God himself. And here's the good news for you today is that even if you don't have a strong family lineage of faith that you feel like, man, I was just raised in the ways of the Lord. My parents were models of Jesus to me. Even if you don't have that, Jesus has redefined generational legacy to expand far beyond your biological family and not only has he expanded that vision, he has empowered us to be able to live for a legacy that's bigger than ourselves. Jesus, in 33 AD, after his life, death, and resurrection, he commissions his disciples. We've looked at this passage multiple times over the last several weeks. But here's the great commission again. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. There it is again, to follow God's commands. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So here's Jesus taking this theme, this biblical thing of, of generational legacy and expanding it beyond just the family unit to all the nations of the earth. He just said, no, 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 this is my intention. When I called Abraham to myself to make a great people, I would send the Savior through Abraham's lineage to be the blessing to the entire world. And now through faith in Jesus Christ, anyone can be a part of the family of God for the Jew and for the Gentile. This is now a worldwide scope given to us by our Savior. But it's important to note that the only way we now can be faithful and actually partake in leaving this kind of spiritual legacy is because we have the presence of Jesus with us and we have the Holy Spirit's power within us. You and I, if we seek to do this on our own, apart from relying on the strength of God, we will fall flat on our face time and time again. How many of you parents are like, man, I walk in the flesh way more than I wish that I would, and I'm not the best parent in the world? Am I the only one that feels that way? Okay? No. This is a battle. But we do have the presence of Jesus. We do have the power of the Holy Spirit to equip us and empower us to do this. Not perfectly, but in a healthier way than we would have ever been able to without him. Let's look at the Apostle Paul, who Jesus called to himself, empowered by the Spirit to leave a generational legacy. One of his spiritual sons, he had many, but one of them was Timothy. And Timothy, he calls a son. He wasn't his biological son, but he was a spiritual son. And here's Paul's instruction to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 13-14. He says, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to us. Again, it's about being in Christ and being empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then in 2 Timothy 2, 2, he goes on to say this. He says, Timothy, don't just do it yourself, but pass it on. He says, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others as well. And so put the multi-level marketing scheme picture up there. So check this out. Anyone familiar with MLMs? Huh? Anybody? We can laugh. It's okay. Okay. Anyone in MLMs? Don't raise your hand. We don't want to know. Um, so here's the deal. 
Paul, obviously under Christ, one of his spiritual sons was Timothy. There was Titus. There was others. But he's saying, Timothy, entrust and teach those who are faithful what you've learned and make sure that those are able to teach others as well. So you see this multiplication effect taking place in passing on the faith to the next generations. And there's a book uh, that, I, that I really enjoy. It's called Personal Disciple Making, written by Chris Adsit. And he's real involved in, in Campus Crusade Ministry, which is now Crew. But uh, he set forth this, this comparison to really illustrate the power of multiplication. He says, there's two different ministry strategies. Let's, let's hypothetical take two different ministry strategies. The first one is kind of your mass evangelistic campaign. This is your Billy Graham crusades. This is your Greg Laurie crusades in modern day history. Now let's say you're a part of that ministry and your goal is to see a thousand people come to Christ every day. Does that sound like a good goal? Sound like a big goal? Yeah, no one would be like, that's horrible. Like, awesome, a thousand people a day coming to Christ? We'll take it. We'll check this out. At this rate, it would take 14,000 years to reach the current population of this planet. <laughs> that's not taking into consideration the fact that the daily population growth rate is 220,000 people. Does that thousand people a day sound like a big goal anymore? No. No. That's crazy. You, you look at the numbers, and you're like, wow, even at that rate, like we are fighting a losing battle. And the other thing we've learned from these evangelistic crusades over the last 50, 60 years is that they leave people as spiritual infants. They don't ground them in the word of God. They don't ground them in the, the importance of being involved in the local church. They lack discipling and growing people up in the Lord. Now let's look at the power of multiplication. Let's say you went out and you reached a neighbor for Christ. You shared the gospel. You shared your testimony. They come to believe and receive Christ as their Lord. And you take a year and you invest in them spiritually. You teach them the, the commands of the Lord, as we see in the Great Commission. You teach them how to read God's word and how to grow in Christ. You teach them how to have spiritual conversations with, with those in their lives and to proclaim the gospel. Say you invest them for a year, real intentionally. Then the next year, you both go and do the same. And you both reach one person for Christ and you invest in them. And then it doubles every year like that. Do you know that in just 33 years you would reach the current world population for Christ through that model. Not only that, but everyone in that process would have been discipled. They would have been mentored. They would have been poured into and grown deep roots in their faith and been equipped to reproduce their lives. And even if after that 33 years, the world population went from 6 billion to 10 billion, it would only take one more year. In the whole world to be reached. That means in a lifetime, the world could come to Christ through a multiplication ministry strategy. Again, it doesn't always work so nice and neat, right? It's not like this is, this is how it plays out all the time. But the purpose of me sharing this is to really illustrate the power of multiplication and why all of us need to be actively involved in growing and also pouring out into the lives of others. Not just making converts, but making disciples. That's really important. And now I want to ask you a strange question. Are you more like the Sea of Galilee, or are you more like the Dead Sea? Okay? Some of you laugh because you know where I'm going with this. Others of you are like, I've never heard of the Galilee and the Dead Sea. What are you talking about? It's Middle Eastern geography. But here's the deal. Chris Atzit in his book continues to give this comparison. He says, there are two large lakes in Israel, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee has a number of rivers flowing into it, and to the south, the Jordan River flows out of it. It's a beautiful, healthy lake full of aquatic life. The Jordan rolls southward for about 60 miles and then into the Dead Sea. Several other rivers flow into the Dead Sea as well, but it is a rare body of water in that no rivers flow out of it. Because of this, the mineral content of water is extremely high, 
choking out all possibility of life. They don't call it the Dead Sea for nothing. And now is the point where we're all going to feel conviction. He says this, Many Christians, like the Dead Sea, always take and never give. They have sat in churches, prayed, and studied the scriptures for years. They could pass on so much that would feed life to new Christians, but nothing flows out of them. We gain wisdom, knowledge, and experience, not only that we can benefit, but also that others can benefit when we pass it on. And that would just be a question I would have for all of us this morning, is are you in any way, shape, or form involved in spiritually investing into somebody else's life? Are you intentionally pouring out what you yourself have received from Christ even into one other person's life? Or are you in a place where you're like, I, I've never been invested in. If that's you, let us know. We'll, we'll connect you with somebody. We'll walk you through growing in Christ. But I would argue, church family, that the true test of a mature Christian is their ability to pass on what they have learned to others. And not only their ability, but their active involvement in doing so. And here's what I believe with all of my heart, that it takes all of us investing into one another and to those who come to Christ for us to be a healthy, thriving church that leaves the kind of generational legacy that Christ calls us to do. And here's the thing. I want to encourage you because a lot of people would say, I don't know how to do that. It's not rocket science. It's not complicated. And we as a church are trying the best that we can to keep a simple framework of ministry so that it can be reproduced, so that it can be transferred, so that you don't feel like you have to be a pastor to invest in somebody else spiritually. And that brings us to our next core value, which is intentional simplicity. Now, before we get into this, I just want to ask, how many people can guess what the graphic on your notes is? Any guesses? Who said that? What did you say? A trellis. a trellis. Boom. First guess. Everyone else was like, I have no clue. And then the gardener showed up and told us what was up. That's a trellis, and we'll get there. But let me read this, this paragraph about intentional simplicity. It says, we will fight to maintain a simple but focused schedule and ministry framework in order to enable each person to focus on those things which are most important, following Jesus and fishing for men. We will strive to maintain a simple and pure devotion to Christ. Now, the day that the early church was birthed was a pretty unique day, the day of Pentecost, right? The Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples, they're praying, they begin to praise God in all these different languages. Like, it, it's, it was a unique day in history. However, there are some principles that we can draw out of that day. Because we see this both and dynamic here. We see Peter preaching to the thousands the gospel, but then we also see the ramification of their faith in the gospel. So let's read Acts 2, starting in verse 41. Peter's just done preaching. It says, So those who received his word, the gospel, were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. So hey, we'd celebrate that day, right? 3,000 people put their day, faith in Christ. But then check out the result. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And then jumping down to verse 36, it says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This was an exciting time to be a part of the church. Does it not sound exciting? 3,000 people believe they're devoting themselves to the Lord. And day by day more people are coming to faith. Like I want to be a part of that. And I love that it tells us that they, they weren't just like, oh, cool. I got my get out of hell free card, believe in Jesus, now I'm going to go home, be by myself. It says no. The response was that they devoted themselves to God's word, to fellowship, and prayer. 
And it says that they experienced that in two primary contexts. First, they gathered in the temple. The temple, that's the corporate gathering. That's, hey, let's all get together. Okay? That was one way they gathered. But then it says that they broke bread in their homes. So they had large group gatherings and they had small group gatherings. That's the rhythm of which they did life together. In a book that we read through, it's a ministry philosophy book. It's called The Trellis and the Vine. It puts forth a paradigm that helps us think through why we do the things we do as a church. And so again, the trellis represents any ministry structure. So any structured ministries we would have, like a Sunday morning or our small groups, that would be a part of our trellis. But what we need to remember, what's so critical, is that the trellis only exists to support the growth of the vine. So that the vine would flourish. So that the vine would do what it was made to do and bear fruit and be a blessing to those around it. So let's put up that picture of our trellis real quick. Okay, this is a most basic trellis. This is the exact trellis that I had in my garden this year. But uh, I want to walk through this just so you guys have a, a, a framework and understanding of how we think through what we do as a church and why we do this. So you have our, our main two uh, verticals, Sundays and regroups, which is our small groups. And those are the two that are f- planted firmly in the ground. Like those are the two structures that we will always have these two structures and everything else is built off of these two structures, okay? So as we gather on Sunday mornings, we're committed to preaching through the Word of God. We teach expositional most of the time here, which is verse by verse through books of the Bible. So, And when we gather on Sundays, we praise God through song. We pray corporately. We partake of communion. This is all what we do in the, the quote-unquote temple gathering, the large group corporate gathering. Then we have regroups. Regroups is when we're, we're in each other's homes. We're literally breaking bread together and eating meals together, enjoying time with one another. But we're also going deeper. Maybe it's studying something else in the Bible. Maybe it's ha- having discussion around the sermons and the text we're already studying through. But that's more the life on life where we're encouraging each other. We're spurring each other on in the faith. And what I want you to note on this is that all the vertical columns... All the vertical structures are ongoing week-by-week ministries that we engage in. And I'll get to the horizontal ones here in a minute. But all the vertical ones are ongoing, things we have all the time. So let me take a minute to talk about journey groups. Journey groups are ideally made up of smaller groups within your regroup. So that would be like two to three men or women who get together on a regular basis to dive even deeper to have accountability in reading the word together, to pray for one another, to pray for those in your life who are yet to know Christ, to just be deep and real, a place where you can just bear your life with people in a safe environment where you're encouraged and built up in the faith. And so there I want to pause for a minute. And again, this is, this is just as you observe Jesus' life and ministry and how he did things. So Jesus had many disciples beyond the 12 disciples, many people who would consider themselves disciples, and they followed him around. But in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out 72 disciples, two by two. So I want you to think about it like this. Like 72 were gathered at one point in time, and, and he uh, sends them out. But that would be more of a larger group gathering, right? Like how many of you guys could fit 72 people in your house? I couldn't, okay? Maybe a few of you, but I can't, okay? So 72, there's this group. Then he had the 12 disciples. Now how many of you could fit 12 people in your house, okay? Everybody in the room, if you have an apartment, you can fit 12 people in an apartment, right? Jesus had his 12 that he engaged, that he really invested in. But then when you get over to that journey group, Jesus had three who really were his closest companions. He had Peter, James, and John. These were the guys that got to experience the most. They saw the most. I just read through the transfiguration the last week. And who's with Jesus on the mountain? It's Peter, James, and John. Okay? That he had his closest inner circle. And that's really a a ministry framework we want to say is, hey, different things take place in different contexts. And all of these contexts are meant to work together to produce and promote the growth of the vine. They don't exist just because it's like, oh, this is just a cool thing we should do. It's, again, the purpose is for spiritual growth. And that's where I want to come to our last vertical 
uh, column there on the trellis is kids and students, okay? We as a church firmly believe that it is the parents' primary responsibility to disciple their kids and to raise their kids in the ways of the Lord. So we as a church and we as pastors are committed to coming alongside parents and equipping them to do the work that they're able to do on a day in and day out basis. We have a bunch of resources. If you're struggling or you need help there, let us know. We want to help. But all we do for the kids' ministry is to really supplement and reinforce all the things that parents are trying to teach their kids within the home, to have another source affirming the truth, okay? And now the student piece and the kids, this is both important to to note, is we live in a world where we are losing the battle for our youth, are we not? We are losing the battle. And it's depressing. And I would say mostly it's because of the deconstruction of the traditional family unit. That's why. You have a fatherless generation that has no clue about how to live for the things of the Lord or be raised in the Lord. But for us, we put students on there as an ongoing investment because we realize not only do parents of teenagers need others to come alongside and encourage them, because that can be hard, right? But there are Thousands of students in this city who are being raised in faithless homes. Where do those kids go? Where do they go? What if they have no no one to turn to in their home? We as a church need to be there for them. We as a church need to provide a platform to invest in the spiritual lives of the youth and to intentionally go out and find them and to love them and to encourage them in the hope of the gospel. So that's why we put that as a vertical rung. It's something that we are committed to as a church. Again, the vertical are ongoing ministries, and then the horizontal are are ministries that are kind of like one-off type ministries. And let me explain what I mean by that. So Belong, that's our membership class. If you've been here any length of time, you're going to hear us talk about Belong. You're going to hear us rag you about getting into Belong and going through our membership class. And it's not just because we want to have an awesome membership roster. It's because we want you to understand who we are as a church, what we believe, what we stand for, how we do things. And if you align with that, we want you to be a part of it. But if this isn't the church for you, that's okay. Tell us what you're looking for. Maybe we'll be able to direct you in the right place. But we want everyone who's here and who belongs to Redemption Church to say, man, I know why I'm here, and I'm excited about being a part of what God's doing through this church. I'm not just informed, but I'm excited about it. I want to participate in what God is doing here. So again, Belong is kind of a one-time class that you go through to, to learn more about us. And then equip, and this is a little bit broader. So last summer we did these equipping classes. Some of you led these equipping classes on how to study the Bible or what, how do we parent in a way that honors God or how do we invest into our marriages. What do we do about finances? All these kind of things. These are all just classes based upon biblical principle, but also practical needs within the church. We say, hey, we want to invest in you so that you have the tools to thrive as a follower of Jesus and lead in the way God calls you to in all the different avenues of leadership God has placed you in. And then above that is multiply. So this is how we invest into leaders. This is uh, all of our small group leaders. We gather monthly to invest into them, to help them see, hey, it's not just about having a small group. It's about multiplying your life, multiplying your ministry into other people. That's why we have a Pastor Leadership Institute, which is a two-year training program for people who are aspiring to pastoral ministry. But the whole purpose of that top ring is to multiply. It's not just so that we would just grow as one church. It's so that we would be multiplied out and become multiple churches and continue to expand God's grace to the world around us. So those are the the three primary rungs on uh, the trellis there that go horizontally. But again, let's put up that next trellis picture with actually something living on it. So again... I showed you the bear picture, just so you know, this is the structure, but again, cannot emphasize enough, is this is what we're after, and I should have like put massive clusters of grapes on there or something, but like, it's so that we would produce fruit, and if we're a vine that's bearing fruit, we are going to feed those who come by, we're going to nourish the world 
around us. That is the whole purpose. But again, church, in order to grow healthy, we need some structures to support our growth. Now, here's the thing. I think if you went to some churches and you asked them to like draw their trellis, it would be a whole heck of a lot more complicated than this. <laughs> it would be a lot more complicated. Uh, there are churches I know that they have something going on every single night of the week. Like if you want to be busy with church stuff, you can be busy with church stuff, right? But here's the problem. is I think we can deceive ourselves into spiritual maturity by being so spiritually busy that we're not spiritually available to those in our lives, our neighborhoods, our friends, our coworkers. It's like, oh, let's hang out Wednesday. Sorry, got something going on at church. What about Thursday? Yeah, it's something else at church. What about Friday? Yeah, something else at church. It's like, gosh, what is your problem? Why are you at church three nights a week? Go home. Hang out with your neighbors. Okay? But here's, this, this is the thing, is that we as a church want to combat getting so busy. And spiritual things aren't bad. We just don't want to be so busy and filled that we don't have any margin in our life for what God has also called us to do. To be a light in the world. To shine out, not just keep our light huddled here inside the church building. I think it's important for us to note, and I hope that you saw through both generational legacy and intentional simplicity, that relationship really is the means through which all of this takes place. It's life on life. We have to be intentional with the relationships that God puts in our path. And we see that where we do that both within our homes, within the church, and with the world around us. And this has to bring us all the way back to God's initial vision and initial purpose for us to flourish. Because he loves us. God loves us. And the ultimate demonstration of that love was that he sent his son to restore the broken relationship that our sin destroyed. And church family, if you are here and you have received the love of God through faith in Jesus Christ, you are called to pass that love on to others. You aren't called to keep it to yourself. You're called to let the life of Christ flow out through you to be a blessing to all of those around you. But this takes intentionality. This takes catching a vision of what God can do through your life. It's bigger than you, and it's not about you. And in 2 Corinthians 5.14, this is how Paul says it. He says, for the love of Christ controls us. Let me just stop right there. Can you say that? <laughs> but can you say that honestly of yourself? <laughs> the love of Christ controls me. Let's keep reading. Having concluded this, it's a finished matter, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that what? So that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. This is, this is what, back to gospel-centered people, we talked about that a couple weeks back, being centered on Jesus Christ and the hope of the gospel, allowing him to be the one to lead and direct our lives. And if he's told us, hey, go make a difference in the world. Go leave and continue my spiritual legacy to the next generation. Go live with simple devotion to Christ and have that be what people know you for more than anything else. That's the call. That's the commission. I want to ask you all to bring out your communion elements today. We're going to actually partake as one, as a family, all together. But I want us to collectively, if you're here and your faith is in Christ, communion is for you. If you're here and you don't know where you're at with Jesus, you don't know if you've trusted in Christ or given your life to him, then I would just ask you to, to pass on the elements. But if you are in Christ, he has told us. To do this, to remember him, to remember his body that was beaten for us, his blood that was shed for us. And so I had to give you a minute of time because these things are near impossible to open. I know that and I apologize. 
I'm like hearing people just now. See, I'm, I'm, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but let's all take the cracker as a representation of Christ's body that was given for us. And let's partake together. Jesus likewise took the cup and he said, this is the blood of my new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of many. So again, if you are in Christ and you are trusting that his blood has covered your sin, let us partake in remembrance of his great act of love. I love how 1 Corinthians 11 kind of ends after that. It says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And if you've read the end of the Bible, we see that Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> what is soon? I don't know. But it's soon. And it's soon for every generation that lives on this planet. We just know that it's soon and we know that he's coming. So my heart and my prayer is that we would be a people who are going about Jesus' business while we wait. And that when he comes, he would find us doing the things he has called us to do. Amen? Amen. Let's pray towards that end. Father, thank you that it is possible for your love to control us. I think each of us know that there are moments of every day where we are not controlled by the love of Christ. And yet, God, thank you for your constant grace that we can constantly repent and turn and trust in you. And that, God, your mercies are new every morning. No matter how bad we messed up yesterday, even this morning driving in here, it doesn't matter. Your mercy is new. And, God, you've empowered us to live differently. So I just pray we as your church would be those who shine your light brightly in the midst of a dark world, that you would remind us of the hope that we have through your promises, through the greatest act of love in the gospel, that Jesus laid down his life so that we could be forgiven of sin and have a future hope beyond our wildest imagination. So Father, would we just sing the simple words of this song now unto you as a reflection of praise flowing from our hearts. In Christ's good name. Amen.